This might be a fun lecture, but it's also a, a fairly complicated lecture. This is an extremely complicated lady here, up here. And I'm going to do with this, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to do this properly, I'm going to talk to you a wee bit, not just about perhaps what you came to hear, which is Zelda and her um, problems and her, you know, the way in which she, pa you know, the way in which she left. No, that's not tonight. Tonight's not pity Zelda night. Tonight is just to talk about a really, really marvelous woman at a really, really marvelous time. It frankly, it happens to be my favorite time in cultural history. You name your city and you name your era. It could be Florence and the Renaissance, and Gabi will probably be for you even further back, and, and Chang'an in the Tang Dynasty, or Rome, or e London in the Elizabethan time. I liked Paris in the 1920s, the so-called Jazz Age. And I just thought tonight we would pro focus a bit, because we've, we've been here before, some of us. I met you, I think, talking about these things. I wrote this book a long, long time ago. I had a lot of fun, but it wasn't the best book I've ever written in my life. All about the people who were in Paris, many of them Americans, not all of them, gathering together to, I should say, really to, to find themselves as, as writers, as artists, as musicians. Um, we've talked about Nancy Cunard once in a Think Olio. We had a hell of a lot of fun. Nancy Cunard, who you probably know just because she was terribly, terribly rich and uh, <laughs> with about four different Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> Nancy Cunard, who I talked about at Olio as one of, I, th I think, one of the most interesting poets of the time. Here's some, these are the women. These are the women. Tonight we concentrate on the women. Flappers, some might call them, but I don't want to dwell on the flapper side. I'd rather call them the philosophers than the flappers. There's Coco Chanel, you know about her, Gabriella Chanel. Dorothy Parker, not up and down vehemently, if you know who I'm talking about. Great, great friend, actually, very loyal friend of Zelda Fitzgerald's. When they all gathered at the Villa America, Gerald and Sarah Murphy's home, Dorothy Parker and Zelda and Dorothy Parker just to really ruin the suspense of the evening, when Zelda had her big exhibition of paintings in New York at the Algonquin, and not too many people were queuing up to buy Zelda's paintings, Dorothy Parker made sure that somebody bought one painting at that show. That's a loyal friend. Josephine Baker, I shamelessly put this photo in because I just like it. <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> obviously, obviously if I cut it out. They were you notice Gertrude Stein's not up here. <laughs> Actually, Gertrude Stein's not up here. And some of you know a lot about Zelda, right? And I know you do. You're like a ringer. You, you too? It's frightening. for A ringer, by the way, in hockey is someone who plays really well and shouldn't be out there with the amateurs. So you know a lot about Zelda. Why wouldn't Gertrude Stein be up here? They didn't get along. Gertrude Stein would say to Zelda when she and, and what's his name, Mr. Zelda? Can't remember the name. <laughs> would come to, to Gertrude Stein's salon, and Gertrude Stein would say to Zelda, you sit, or it would be more like this, you sit over there in the corner with the, with the women, with Hadley Hemingway. She didn't have Gert, uh, Zelda come and join them where they were having the literary discussion. So Gertrude's out, and also Gertrude doesn't look like that. <laughs> Tallulah Bankhead, now if you know your Zelda, you know what about Tallulah? Yeah, <laughs> oh, no, sister. Now, Tallulah wouldn't, be, wouldn't not have been quite as interested in Scott as, as her sister. And the Bankheads were both from <whistles> Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama, yeah. The Bankhead, Tallulah Bankhead, famous uh, movie star and Broadway star, was from Montgomery, Alabama. Knew Zelda when they were kids, when Zelda was the really, really naughty, really naughty daughter of the very, very famous judge in Montgomery, Alabama. That's Tallulah Bankhead. These are all, and oh, I wish we'd zoom. This, is, this would be a phenomenal lecture. Do you know about this one? This is Tamara de Limpitka. You do, probably, Gabby. No? These are her paintings. Really, really fascinating woman. Kind of a pretend to be countess from Poland. Yeah, right. Uh, a very, 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 um, a speed. That's what Zelda would call her. You know what a speed is? A little fast. A little. A lot of, lot of fun. And I don't just mean the Bugatti that she's driving in this. So it's a fascinating time for women in art and music and literature. A really, really fascinating time. And it was a great place. I don't have to probably sell you this, but I might as well try for a second. Can you imagine Paris in the 1920s for a second? You're sitting in a cafe. Picasso's there. Joyce is somewhere. They're walking by. Everybody is there. This was the. This was also the place, incidentally, where you could escape censorship. You could escape the stigma uh, and the and the discrimination of being back here in New York. Um, 
I'll wave this around and smirk a little bit. You can get a drink. <laughs> Why was Paris so exciting? That's <laughs> very good. No prohibition. You know, it's one of the most embarrassing things about standing up here is I'm related to Calvin Coolidge <laughs> on my father's side. Can you imagine that? And here I am with <laughs> two extra beers back here, and I talk too much. Silent Cal. And <laughs> past prohibition. This was the couple that um, my first book was mainly about, Gerald and Sarah Murphy. They were the, um, he went to a very nice prep school, actually, called Hotchkiss. Then he went to Yale. P and he was, he and Sam, this was Sarah Murphy. She was the great muse of almost everybody, Philip Barry, Archibald MacLeish, Sam, Sam, Archibald MacLeish. And Picasso, who painted her, is Murphy, Sarah Murphy and Picasso. She was from East Hampton. I'm actually wearing. Gerald Murphy's uh, pocket square. The family rather liked me. I don't know why. God only knows why. I wrote very seriously about his paintings and about him. I, I really, actually, I really revered that. Yeah. His actual pocket square. That's his actual pocket square. And I, I was wondering as I was coming down here if Zelda hadn't used it, you know, to <laughs> why, maybe Zelda's DNA is on this thing. That's his, the family gave it to me after my book came out because they really liked the seriousness with which I wrote about his art, and I, I discovered one of his paintings, or I helped to publish it for the first time, so they liked me. And this was a really, really fascinating couple, and many, many, many times, Zelda and what's his name, Mr. Zelda, went to the Villa America, drank very heavily, in fact, they smashed a few of their glasses off the, off the roof uh, into, the, into the garden, but there was, and I, some of you might have heard me say this once before, there was a, a patio, a stone patio with a linden tree and a long table, and at that table, and I'm not making it up, it would be Gerald and Sarah, and it would, might be Stravinsky and Balanchine, because the Ballet Russe was a really big part of it. They painted the sets for the Ballet Russe, and it might be also Hemingway, not, not obviously going to be a big part of this evening's lecture. She hated him, and he hated her, boy. And it might be, of course, Zelda and Mr. Zelda, what's his name? And it would be, no, I'm not, I'm not done yet, because it could also be MacLeish, and it could be um, Stravinsky, all at one table, all having a chat that you can just imagine for Mr. Zelda when he was working on the draft of The, of the Great Gatsby, or for Balanchine, who was a 22-year-old Russian kid still hungry, coming out. It, it, can you imagine what this meant to them and to their art and to their intellects? This was, it was an amazing place. As I say, Picasso was there, and pa Picasso painted Sarah Murphy. I think this is one of the most beautiful paintings of the period. I, un unashamedly, I say that there were masterpieces of the jazz age. And by golly, I'm timely. I forgot to mention this. The New York Times Today art section, jazz age at the Cooper Hewitt. Bloody Amazon is doing this bloody series about Zelda. I'm so, ti I'm so timely, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So, we, so we get to, now let's get to, to her, because she was there, and she was a big part of it. And not, I mean, even, I could, I could make jokes, but, you know, I could make a lot of jokes about Picasso and Zelda, because Picasso felt that she drank too much. Pfft. Shocking, you know? <laughs> that she talked too fast. Picasso's English wasn't so great. Picasso, actually, Picasso's languages were pretty good. Russian, and he, he could get along with, because Olga was the wife, and Spanish, of course, and French, and, his English was not so bad. The only word Picasso never n ever heard, I think, in any language from a woman especially was no. <laughs> but, P but Picasso felt that she talked too fast, and she spoke in English, and she, she uh, drank too much. But P there she is. And then we start. And if you know more than I know, that's not fair. You're a ringer. But this is a, this is a, the, a picture of her in her family's garden in Montgomery, Alabama. Daddy was a judge. You know that part, right? She was the fifth of her family, one brother, very sad story, which I'm not going to get into too much. She was the wild child, a speed. She liked to um, go out with boys. Shame on her. This is a picture, by the way, in her garden uh, when she was in, one, in her ballet costume. We'll come back to ballet in a second. She was quite a, it, then she was quite a serious dancer, and later on she became a really, really almost too serious uh, ballet dancer. She really gave her life to it. You know about that, nodding up and down vigorously, I can see. So this is a picture just before she would go on stage at places like the Montgomery Country Club, where she often would dance in recitals. And the Montgomery Country Club happens to be the place 
where she met. Mrs. What's his name? Mr. Zelda, <laughs> right. And how old was she at that time? 19. Well done. Maybe 17, maybe 18. And there is, there is this uh, very funny series starring, what's her name? There. What's her name? Richie? Christina Richie. Yeah, very good. Blonde hair, short. And she would have looked just about like this. Doubt that she was actually doing one of her ballets of that day, but, but he was there. And he was dressed in uniform. And as far as she could tell, he was just some damn Yankee, right? But actually, he was, he's not from New York. Those of you who think he's from New York, he's not. He's from Minnesota. Minnesota, right? And she met him at one of these dances when she was just about this age. Now, big problem about chronology with, with, with Zelda's early life. Part of it is, of course, not, not so much when they met. We know that when they met, they met in a country club dance, and he was in uniform. And you know he probably looked pretty, in fact, very, very spiffy. Boots always shine. Brooks Brothers, Brooks Brothers tailored his uniform. Christy Jiang, remember when I walked you to Brooks Brothers when in the middle of your, your damn jazz age seminar? So you got to go by Brooks Brothers. So Brooks Brothers does his uniform. So he's looking pretty spiffy. They meet. But as you probably know, he wasn't the only chap, right? There were many, many other boys. And there was this porch with this swing. And Zelda was rather famous for the, her antics on that swing, including, you know, like this. And don't get mad at me, but she wrote that, right? And I want to come back to that quote a little bit later. So, boom, there's, fit, there's what's his name? There's Zelda, 18 years old. He's supposed to go off to war and never makes it to the front. Ends up in New York after the armistice. Ends up actually in a job doing what? Who's the, who's the big? Uh, I know you know a lot about him because we went to the same school. I'm wearing, by the way, I'm wearing this ugly tie because I lived in his dormitory. Yes, advertising. Very good. He and a man named Hart Crane were here in New York in advertising, right around the corner from Grand Central, as a matter of fact. She was still back in Montgomery. The letters are phenomenal. You've read them, I hope. Really, really marvelous love letters. Do you like love letters? I do. I love love letters. Winston Churchill to Clemmy. Fitz, actually, Sarah and Gerald Murphy, I love love letters. I think they're phenomenal. Beautiful love letters back and forth. She gave him a flask. <laughs> Zoom is familiar with this. <laughs> this, this probably comes from about the time when my, my ancestor passed prohibition. I've had this thing since then. But her, his flask, I don't have it. I wish I did. It's inscribed to him. And also, it says, do you know what it says? You seem to know a hell of a lot. Forget me, forget me not, this 18-year-old kid Gives, gives him a forget-me-not. It's inscribed to, it, it's his regiment, and it's inscribed to, the, he was a lieutenant. And that's what led to, in 1920, they were married. Do you know where they're married? St. Patrick's Cathedral. And where are the pictures of their wedding? There are none. <laughs> she, this wedding went like this. And her, even her sister couldn't make it to the wedding. They, they were married at St. Patrick. He went, by the way, he went back and forth three times courting her. It's a lovely, it took a real courtship, beautiful letters, back and forth three times. In the meantime, one week before they get married, this side of paradise comes out. Remember this side of paradise? Oh, yeah. Every, every Princeton freshman <laughs> quotes, this side of, <laughs> quotes this side of paradise when we, get, when we get to Princeton right away. One week before they get married, this side of paradise comes out. Scribner's is the publisher. Who's the editor? God, I'll give you extra credit. John, I'll give you extra credit if you name this one. And actually, they made a bloody movie about him. Maxwell, yeah, you got it. Oh, you know. Cool. <laughs> Maxwell Perkins. His office is still up there. And it absolutely takes off. So they become the it couple. And, and now we're going to get into the, the, di the difficult part, perhaps, of my lecture, which is he wrote, she wrote, right? He wrote this, she said, or she wrote that. Whether he dipped into her journals and diaries, whether what she said ends up in not just this side of paradise, but also the beautiful and Dan and Tales of the Jazz Age, that's going to be part of, part of our fun tonight. That's the famous portrait, the Hearst portrait that she called it the, her Elizabeth Arden face. That's a wonderful, that, by the way, these quotations are from a, a novel that she wrote called Save Me the Waltz. And we're going to 
We're going to read from Acts. I think actually this may be the most important part of this evening, is for you to hear a wee bit of Save Me the Waltz, her novel, which is completely under the weather when it comes to his reputation and his novels. And you know, Zoom and I have talked a lot about how great a novel Gatsby is and what happened after Gatsby. How, to me, what happened after Gatsby is like this. But we, this, tonight, is, tonight is Zelda's. Actually, when I first came to the Strand, I said, hey, do you have Save Me the Waltz? And they, adju they did. They just had Save Me the Waltz, extremely expensive rare book, which they had sold about a week ago. So these quotes are from Save Me the Waltz. This is the Hearst portrait. And this is the Hearst portrait. This wasn't just in one of the magazines. This was the bloody cover of the magazine. So everywhere they're going to go, every club they're going to go into, every hotel they walk into is going to say, there they are. They're the it couple. You know how old they were? This part kills me because I'm so damned ancient now. Dylan, you know how old they were? How old are you, old chap? Yeah, they're, old. they're younger than you. They're, she's nine, she was born in 1900, and, by, and, and she married when she was 20, and by 1921, wherever they go in Manhattan, that, there they are, the, the, the it couple. On the cover, this would be like be on the cover of Vanity Fair. So, and, that's, and that's, boom, this side of paradise, bang, uh, the beautiful and damned, and wham, you know, the, 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 every single one of these stories was coming out, and he was just nailing it. One, one piece after another piece, he was the top paid writer in the world, he was very, very proud of saying. A little bit too much about the money, to be frank with you. I, including, and, and by the way, because I want this to be a balanced uh, e evening, she was a little bit too much about the money sometimes, too. But so there they are at their prime. This is New York. Then, Sam, do you remember the next chapter? Because New York, it was a little bit too much of the, uh, too many parties, right? In fact, the Biltmore chucked them out. <laughs> Where's, where do they go next? Uh, they go to Paris? No, not yet. You're getting ahead. Uh, kind of like upstate New York. It's, you know, it's, it's not Manhattan, so we, we call it upstate. No, it's called, it was called Westport, Connecticut. And she, <laughs> she thought, like Jackson Pollock, she thought, oh, well, get him out of the city. Maybe he'll dry, dry out a little bit. So they go out to Westport, and every single one of their friends who was drunk, all, and, and by the way, oh, I, actually, I should get back to this one. Everybody who drinks too much comes up to Westport, and they're on the beach, and they're partying like hell. So that didn't work. So the next thing they do, and this is, Sam, this is what I was queuing you up for, they went to a little house on Long Island. The G is hard. Long Island. <laughs> in a town called Great Neck. Anybody know? I, I grew up. I, I, I grew up in Manhasset, right around the corner. I knew Sands Point. I don't want to tell you how. It was nice. It was a little rogue right down to the water. <laughs> very quiet, very secluded. The, and all the castles, all the, all the places where Fitz would watch the, the, the Gatsby's of his time entertain the Guggenheim house, you know, and the, the, there was a Hearst house down there too. It was this beautiful, anybody ever da been down there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, right? You know what I'm talking, you know that road? All the way to the end of, Sa of Sands Point, right? And there was Fitz in the garage, uh, over in a room over the garage of a house in Great Neck, Long Island, Long Island, writing the beginning of a book that he called Tremolchio. And it became, of course, the guru, the great, yeah, the great Gatsby. It became, a, in, many, in many people's eyes, maybe not yours, but in many people's eyes, the, the top, the, the great American novel, if you will. Remember, who was, who was it? Max, right? He thought he was the great Gatsby. He was your classmate, <laughs> yeah, right? But I mean, for, for Max, that was the great American novel. He, he started it in Great Neck. The two of them lived there. I'd love to be able to tell you that Zelda was a marvelous um, lady of the house. That she kept a beautiful house and she cooked really well. <laughs> right around the, and by the way, right around the corner lived a chap named Ring Lardner who was drunk at 11 o'clock in the morning. This is really, really bad for the idea of Fitz drying out and somehow. And right across along Northern Boulevard, not up and down if you know what I'm talking about, Northern Boulevard to the, what we call the 59th Street Bridge, the Queensboro Bridge, and into the city, and there you are at the plaza. So they didn't get away from anything. But right there, that's when he began The Great Gatsby. And that's sort of part of, I, I don't know how much time we got, Dylan, but this part of the, our lecture is going to be 
how that book evolved and what Zelda did to make that book, instead of another one of those stories that he was selling to the Saturday Morning Post, something that, and my teacher, by the way, for this, in fact, he, his books are here, was a man named Alfred Kazin. And Kazin hated Fitz. And Kazin, I think, hated everything from Princeton, right? He did all, all those Long Island Sundays was the way Kazin would, would. But Kazin, one time at the Century Club, looked at me at, over lunch and he said, the best sentence ever written by an American, not Henry James, not Mark Twain, not him, was Fitzgerald. It was the last sentence of The Great Gatsby. Who knows it? Close enough. Try it again. So we, so we, try it. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Uh, this is Zelda's night, but my, I'll never forget Kaysen looking at me and saying, I hate him. I hate everything you stand for. And of course, he was looking right at me, you preppy, you know, Ivy League little. But I, that is the sentence, that is the moment. And I think of Gatsby as, a, as a, like an athlete or a, or a dancer or a singer, just out of her mind, out of his range, out of his league, just doing something that he will never be able to do again. But he did it partly because of, of, of Zelda and the next move that they made. I, wanted, I just wanted to do this because it's one of the funniest things I think that, that Zelda ever wrote. They asked her, after the side of Paradise, they asked her, Saturday Morning Post, I believe it was, or the Herald, to review his book. <laughs> it's so cool. It's this fantastic conflict of interest. I love it. In, in publishing, we call this log rolling. And she, if, if, you, if you know the, the voice of that era, you recognize right away one of the great book reviewers of that time was Dorothy Parker. I mean, I see, I hear Parker in this. But it's like, Mr. Fitzgerald, I believe that is how he spells his name. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? She had, and you know, we should really praise Zelda, where Zelda deserves praise. She was a very, very funny lady. And she was a really very clever writer. In fact, some of those stories that were being published at that time, some of them under his name, right? What's his name? Some of them under her own name were, were written by her and written with tremendous facility and speed. I want to get back to that when we read from Save Me the Waltz. There's Christina Ricci. Don't mind looking at that for a moment. It's a funny series. You've seen it? Anybody seen it? Not up and down? Yeah? You like it? Why do you like it? The judge is good. Hmm? Yeah, it, it, it gives you a chance to visualize yeah. you know, what she was like, especially when she was young. The, the chap who plays the judge, I've forgotten his name. He's always on television. Ah, he's good, and he's stiff, and mommy's really nice, and she's, she's OK. I don't know. These were the friends. And when you watch that series, these are the real ones. This is Bunny Wilson, Edmund Wilson. He went to a very good university. He was a very, very bright guy. And he was a really, really good um, tutor to Fitz when it came to what you should read and what, you, what is important, what is not. This is Carl Van Vechten. We could have a whole evening about him. Oh, oh, oh. Also from the South, real gossip column. He's like the Truman Capote of his time and a very, very good photographer. If you ever need to do research, young lady, on what you're working on, because I happen to know you're working on this, that's, he, that's the chap you want. And you also want to read his very dishy diaries. He's like Capote at that time. You could, you could boo if you want. <laughs> boo. <laughs> not, he, not Zum. Zum loves him. Sorry, Zum, right? The first, uh, actually, do you know, do you know what her, her word for him was? It starts with a B. And she, and she, I think she said it when Hadley was still there. And Hemingway at this time, and that's a, one of my favorite pictures of him. That's when he was in the Shakespeare and Company bookshop, bookshop in Paris. And he was a kid. Look at him. Look at him. He just wants to have his picture right up there on the wall next to Conrad, next to Joyce. That's him in Paris at that time. But she looked right at Hemingway. And she said to, to, to what's his name, Mr. Zelda, bogus. Bogus. He's a fake. Nobody's as masculine as that. And, she, and he had some really nasty things to say about her, too, which I'm not going to get into. Here they are on the Champs Elysees. And this is the cool time, OK? Sam, this is what you're talking about. 1923, they were in Great Neck. 19, the end of 1923, Mr. Zelda writes a play, and it bombs. Let's get out of town. And he's drinking too much. What a surprise. Let's get out of town. We get on a, a ship. We're on our way to Paris. This is, this is Zelda. She'd had her little baby, Scotty. It's the one, by the way. And she really did say it. I hope she grows up to be a little fool. 
when she was born. And there, there he is, Mr. Z Mr. Zelda. They started off in Paris, and then they ended up down near the Z Murphys in Antibes, where he set up to revise the great Gatsby in the company of those people I was mentioning before. So in conversation with the, I don't know, I don't like to use this term too often, right? It's like love. The geniuses. Joyce, right? Stein. Uh, Hem was a protege at that time of him. This, so he takes this manuscript and he goes to France. By the way, if you love poetry, Hart Crane did the same thing. He started in Brooklyn, finishes the great masterpiece over in France. There's their passport. <laughs> when, I was a, when I was a kid, when I was at Princeton, ha, she's from Princeton. When I was at Princeton, my real job was to play hockey, but my, other, my, my stupid job was I was a page in the library in the rare books room of the library, rare books, right? And they would send, and we had the, we had the, the archive. We had her, oh, I'll never remember, we had her address book, Zelda's address book. We had these beautiful scrapbooks and big shot um, biographers like Matthew Bricoli, who looked like a bulldog, would come into the rare books room, say, I want this, go get it. And I was the page. I would go downstairs, two floors down, and I was just a terrible page, I'll tell you why. I would get down there, and there, was the, there would be the scrapbook of the Fitzgeralds in, in uh, France, and I'd start looking through it. <laughs> About an hour later, I'd come up, and say, here you are, Professor Bercoli. He'd say, where the hell have you been? <laughs> it was like a bulldog. I'd say, sorry about that. But the, all, of their, all of their papers, everything was there, including this and all the manus a lot of the manuscripts and the letters as well. You should go, including this photo of her in France, but on the crates, it's their address, it's, it's her address, really, in Montgomery, Alabama, and this was when they were in France. She uh, was entranced by the Ballet Russe, to, the Ballet Russe and Sergei Diaghilev, and I, I was talking about Balanchine before. She very desperately wanted to get back into dance. I don't like this picture as much as I like this picture, and she's got the little cat. And the reason I like that is I have a cat, and I want to strangle it half the time. <laughs> Just look at this cat. No, this, oh, my, my cat is really bad. I want to strangle it because it's bad. This cat, I, I always sit, picture her saying to Diaghilev, give me a roll on stage or I will kill the cat. <laughs> <And I> was, <laughs> the cat's lips are turning blue. I want to roll. But she, she, became, um, she became quite, quite serious about the dance. And in Save Me the Waltz, I don't know if I, it be, and, and partly under the influence of, uh, this is Diaghilev's Le Train Bleu, uh, costumes incidentally by Coco Chanel. Whew. How about that? This was when Picasso was hanging around with the Ballet Russe. It was a really great time to have been with the Ballet Russe, but she became, um, shall we say, obsessed by ballet. And this was when she was 25, 26 years old. You know this story, right? What's the problem with that? And, and actually, there's a line in Save Me the Waltz where David, which is the husband, he's an artist, says, you're an amateur. You know, I'm a professional. He was a painter in that, but you can imagine Mr. Zelda saying to Zelda, I'm a professional, you're just an amateur. You get it? And, now, and, and some of you should say, <coughs> but in dance and in ballet, anybody, anybody do ballet? I imagine, yeah. What's the problem with sort of becoming really serious about this at 28? It's too, I know, I know, right? Yeah, I know, I know. And you got, and she, though she had danced in Montgomery to really, really start, and she, and at one point in Naples, they offered her a contract to come and dance. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yeah, yeah to come and dance, to come and dance at the, uh, in Aida at the opera, and, and, and Mr. Zelda said, I'd rather you didn't. But in the, in the novel, Save Me the Waltz, it's sort of, I'm a pro, you're an amateur. I, you know, for ballet, it, uh, it, it's, it sounds cruel, but you almost have a point. I, ha I happen to know that one from the hockey side. I remember, I remember the, one of the first times I played with pros, and I put a move on a famous defenseman named Brad Park, and I went right through him, scored the goal, put my arms up in the air like a little jerk. I was 14 years old. And my dad, who was a famous coach, grabs my jersey and said, chow to head. This guy makes his living playing this sport. Don't, don't be a jerk. And the next time I play, the next, the next period, Brad Park, boom, hits me so hard. Bang! I like, it was like a yard sale. My helmet goes off, my, my stick like this. All the parents, you can imagine all the parents at the hockey rink. This is on Long, Long Island, New Hyde Park. 
oh, what an asshole, you know, he hit that little kid. And my father said, you, des you deserved it. Because in, in, sport, <laughs> in sports, there's a pro and there's an amateur. In ballet, there's a pro and there's an amateur. She tried late to get into ballet. I admire it in many ways, but th this, by the way, led to what happened to her later in life. In other words, this, uh oh, already a question or a comment? You're going to correct me. No, yeah, fire away. I'm cringing. I got, can I run? Just give me 10. I'm going to run to the lift, but then you guys won't tear me apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Garopa. Uh, that yeah. Yeah, the money, she spent tremendous amount of time and she spent a tremendous amount of money. A little bit after this photo was taken, time and money, and she just overdid it, you know. And, and, and just, I'm going to say this right now and then I'm going to stop talking about it. I'm not going to uh, spend much time this evening talking about her uh, mental illness. And it's not, it's not because I'm a great feminist, but, it, but at one point in my life, actually, I was an advocate for people with disabilities, and, and I got an award from NAMI, which was the National Association for Mental Illness or something like that. Uh, this is when I was a saint. <laughs> and one of the things that I found really, uh, what, one of the things I still stand by in a way is uh, privacy. And when I read some of the biographies of Zelda, and they get into the cases, and they, and they quote the, the case notes, of some very, very famous uh, Swiss uh, psychoanalysts, et cetera, and this is in the biography. It's great stuff for a biography. You probably went through all of this stuff, and, and, and he would, Mr. Zelda was in on this too. I'm not talking about that tonight. I, I, I have a, I'm still, uh, I still believe in sort of someone, that, is, that was her private case, and so I'm not gonna talk about that tonight. Uh, we can talk, we can have questions about it, but that's not the emphasis tonight. Now, and, and that, by the way, just that's the last thing I'm going to say about it was this led to her uh, being admitted the first time in Switzerland to an, uh, to an asylum. So that was that part. <laughs> I, I really walked into that. No matter, I was going to try to avoid that, you see, but I really walked into it anyway. This is really what I want to talk to you about tonight. This and her writing. Look at this. She painted. She painted when she was a kid and she painted later. You seen her work? It's really interesting, right? There's a self-portrait, Pamal, right? Well drawn, nice shading. I don't mind the use of color, Pamal, right? This is him, Mr. Zelda, so-called. That's her handwriting, too. Ouch. Uh, fantastic, um, fantastic, almost caricature, especially around the eyes. Listen, I'm allowed to talk like this. I'm a curator and a so-called art critic, too. She's a good painter. She's a good draftsman. Watch. Watch. Here's Times Square. This is a little bit later in her life, from the, from the Paris Times. Look, look, look. Who does it remind you of, those of you who love art? Raoul Du, 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 Du. Yeah, say it, Dufy, right? Absolutely, Raoul Dufy. A little bit of Dufy, a little bit of Lionel Feinger. She, the teacher that she knew to a certain degree was um, Goncharova, who was the Ballet Russe set designer and Larionov, who was um, the, her husband, and they were the private tutors of Gerald and Sarah Murphy, and they were hanging around at the Villa America, so she was chatting them up about, you know, uh, to, to, to be honest with you, a little bit about cubism, but also about perspective, and an interesting, a very interesting space in this, a rather interesting palette, I might say. Scotty and Jack ran Central Time is much later. Scotty is her daughter. Jack is Jack Lanahan, that's her husband. This is Grand Central, you know Grand Central. What's weird about this one, in your opinion? Uh, and, oh, by the way, what's, what's wrong with the clock? Do you, know, do, you, do you know your Grand Central? I walk through it almost every day. What's the clock at Grand Central? Come on, you're bloody New Yorkers, come on. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah well, it has no hands too, Gabby. <laughs> Gabby, come on, clock. No, no, the, the clock at Grand Central, come on, is, is a globular clock by Tiffany, and it's gold, and it's round. This is the Biltmore clock. This is the Biltmore clock brought into this painting. Why the Biltmore clock? That's where they lived. That's where they got chucked out of. When, when, when Mr. Z Zelda and Zelda were in New York in 1921, they were living at the Biltmore, and they got chucked out. So here's her daughter. Here's his, her, his, and, then, and by the way, if you know Grand Central, you know 
that that either she's what I like about this incidentally you're not going to mind if I do this is that elevated point of view right <laughs> this is what Picasso was doing when he was painting for the for the ballet Russe too he was figuring out how a balcony seat <laughs> who's doing that oh I see <laughs> that's pretty good I could do that while I'm up here I'd rather go back to Josephine Baker but no when, when Picasso was figuring out how to paint for the Ballet Russe, he was figuring out those angles, those funny angles. You know, how, how you would see the stage from up here and up here. She's up there. She's up by the, um, you know, where the Apple store is. <laughs> you laugh. Yeah, Zelda hang, hung out at the Apple store all the time at Grand Central. She get, she get into Grand Central, go to the genius bar and say, so you're a genius. My husband's a genius. I wonder when, which one of you is the biggest genius. No, she didn't hang out at the Apple store, but that's from the Apple store and has a very, very funny point of view, very interesting point of view. Again, a little bit like Raoul Dufy, but here's the one that I really want you to pay attention to, those of you who lo know and love art. This is the one of Brooklyn Bridge. And damn, that's an interesting picture. Look at this. For just a second, I'll slow down. The headlines, by the way, um, Gerald Murphy had used headlines in his sets for Within the Quota. So she's playing with that. She's also, all the headlines are from essentially the 1920s, though she painted this picture in the 1930s. Brooklyn Bridge. It's gray, just to make it easy. Those are top hats. Those are empty champagne glasses. Oh, what, a, what a tragedy for Zelda. Empty glasses, right? But the, it's all the 20s, but it's empty and it's gray, ghostly. And there were other paintings, by the way, of that period of the Brooklyn Bridge, like Joseph Stella. Stella, by the way, wrote this beautiful essay that Hart Crane used in The Bridge. But look, look at that. It's a damned interesting painting in many ways. Also, it reminds me a little bit of the palette. Who knows American art in here? Uh, Birchfield, Charles Birchfield? OK, never mind. I'll, I'll pass on all that. But if I may, as a curator, pretty interesting painting. Not bad. Not bad for an amateur, if you will. In fact, better than an amateur. And that's partly why we're here. This is Hope. She did a lot, and if you read the, if you read the novel, Save, Save Me the Waltz, she was, although she, we think of her as a city girl, she did a lot of things about her garden and flowers. She was fascinated by, before I sw switch the slide, what painter, American painter, living in New York at that point, married to an older chap who was a photographer, she really liked his work, Georgia. Georgia O'Keeffe, of course, what? Look, look, bing, 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 bing. Isn't that obnoxious? No, she had just seen, she had just seen the O'Keeffe show in New York. Georgia O'Keeffe, you bet. And now we get into the, these are the paintings that she's best known for. The Mad Hat, these are the Alice in Wonderland ones. Whoa. Now we're, we're now we're talking serious uh, surrealism. Now we're talking about all kinds of. I, I actually see a chap named Francis Picabia and something like this. A lot of surrealism. Very very weird and interesting figural studies too. And remember, she was into the ballet, so muscle tone and muscle development and forms and all those contours. Look 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 look. See, look at this, right? I mean, I don't want to talk about the sad part of the ballet, but you really are just down to sinew and, and, and almost no muscles. It's, it, it's right there. And some of her best paintings, I think, are her figural paintings. And uh, you know, I don't want to beat you over the head with this, all right? But one of the things I wanted to do tonight is say, do you know, she wasn't just the wife of somebody. She was a marvelous painter. And she reminds me, oh, I'm, that's an art historical thing, but I think I'll leave these alone for a while. See, the, the, the palette of this is that gold and that orange that was also very, very big on the Ballet Russe stage. This, a lot of the costumes, especially when the Russians were painting the costume, used that red and gold, but also a w really, really wonderful American painter who uh, worked right up on Bryant Park named Florine Stettheimer. It's getting a little boring, right? I'll, I'll, keep, I'll go a little faster. Sorry about that. I, except that she was part of the art of her time. And I think I remember, actually, Zoom. Uh, where is Zoom? We lost him. I remember being really, really frustrated uh, with, and, and Sam, I think with you too, I, t I talked about this. Fitz was there with Leger, Fernand Leger, with Picasso, with all these guys, these really great big m giants titans of art. And when you read The Great Gatsby, there's almost no art. There's no reference to art. 
she was the one, it seems, if, as we go through the novel in a moment, uh, she was the one who really sort of paid attention to what was coming through, including, by the way, um, Francis Picabia. And this, Picabia did this of um, Mr. Zelda, what's his name, on the beach with, uh, and this was, by the way, when she was, she'd already been committed to, uh, to the first asylum in, in, Gen in near Geneva. So here comes the little secret that I want to share with you. Uh, do you know a little bit about the Gatsby, the evolution of Gatsby? You, you knew Maxwell Perkins, right? He was the genius editor. Yeah, personally, no, I did. Yeah, rub it in, I'm so old. I knew Maxwell Perkins. We grew up together. <laughs> there, was, there was Trimalchio. There was this draft that was, was de developed sort of in, in Great Neck. And then it sort of stopped. And it was OK. In fact, you and I, uh, Sam, you and I did that. We, we talked about the, um, the rich boy and absolution, which were the, the, the stories that he carved out of it. But it got stuck. And Perkins, who's this marvelous editor, you might have seen the movie about Perkins and Tom, Thomas Wolfe. Perkins could shape a, a novel. So Perkins said, try it again, man. And so he took the manuscript of Gatsby. He goes to France. He drinks good wine. He hangs around with geniuses. He, she has an affair. <laughs> we should go into that one at some point, right? You know about that. And, and, that, and Perkins wrote him this marvelous letter. I recommend it to you, where he said, I love a lot of this. I love the way you are, you are in it as Nick, but you're also sort of out of it. So you, you're both in it, and then you're sort of stepping out and observing it. And Nick does that too. But this is my problem with Gatsby. Do you remember this? What was the problem with Gatsby in, the first, in one of the first drafts? Anybody know? Who's, who's really good at this? Who's, a, who's a, a Mr. Zelda expert? Do you know? Perkins said, I just can't see Gatsby. I, I can't picture him. He's too vague. What the hell does he look like? You know, what is his face? What is his body? How are his gestures? And as you, as you might recall, <laughs> as you might recall, I'm doing this to you, right? It's like, what does he look like? What does he, what, what does he look like? How does he talk? What, do, what, are his, what, what is his, um, no, no, but you remember, actually, you remember from the novel. I think one of the most subtle things in the novel is, this, it, it's the party scene, right? And everybody's saying, oh, he murdered a man once, and what does he look like, and I think he's doing this, he's doing that. And all of a sudden, right from behind him, this man comes up and says, I'm Gatsby. And per I love, actually, I love that about the novel, I'm Gatsby. And nobody really knew what he looked like, nobody really knew who he was, and, and he was so vague. And Perkins said, he's so vague. Oh, man, this is the most tempting part of a, of a book I just finished. When he got that letter, she sat down, Zelda sat down, and drew pictures of Gatsby. What would you give, can you imagine, we should just tear the strand apart and try to find them. What would you give, they've been lost, they've been lost, they've been lost. What would you give to see her drawings of Gatsby? And that got him going again on the novel. That's, the little, that's the, one of the little dirty little secrets of tonight's lecture. I don't know what they look like, but I know what they did. Now, just so you know what they might have looked like, this is by Zelda. You know, you know it's fun, right? I mean, uh, uh, Dylan, you and I were looking at all those covers back there. Look at the covers in some of these books. So much fun, right? To, especially the illustrative covers for the, some of these books. She drew, oh, sorry, she drew this for the beautiful and damned. She put an exclamation point in it. I kind of like some of the anatomical detail. It reminds me, by, and, and this is the real one. I thought we would do this because you know we're at the Strand and you guys sell these things, right? This is, the, that's, the, that's the real one. I love, book, I love book covers. I used to commission them when I was a double day. So that's the real one. That's what she drew. If it reminds you of anything, it should remind you of the little nude uh, uh, girls floating in the eye, eyes of the famous Kugat cover, but this is what she would draw for him. Wow. And then he visualized Gatsby based upon these lost drawings. I'm so fascinated because I don't know how you visualize Gatsby. And look at her, she's shut. Of course you like it. Christy, you like it too much. I'm getting my grade change form out right now. Christy, like, how do you visualize? How do you picture Gatsby? Well, I mean, some people are going to say that. People of my generation would probably say that. How do you picture 
<laughs> Somebody like that. How do you picture Gatsby? How do you, how, you know, even as a reader, how do you picture Gatsby? So when she did those drawings, and when she did those drawings, by the way, and I'm sorry if I'm going to get a little nerdy on you for a second, it was exactly the summer, 1924, when Sarah Murphy had just finished doing this for her husband, Gerald Murphy, for a stage play, uh, work that he did, a ballet with Cole Porter called Within the Quota, Sarah did watercolor studies of the characters for the ballet. You following me, right? And Sarah and Zelda are seeing each other every single day. So Sarah does this, and Zelda does, I don't know what, but I would love to know what. I'd give my eye teeth, not, not that I have many teeth left after hockey, to get to have those drawings. These were paper doll cutouts. Some of these still come on, auction market, on the auction market once in a while that she also did. I think that's really a weird one, by the way, of, of Mr. Zelda. This, and now we get to Save Me the Waltz. Zoom, how the hell am I doing on time? Because I have no idea. Just, yeah, have another beer. Go ahead, <laughs> drink up. Okay, now, now that was Zelda the artist. Do, uh, by the way, just so I don't slide by that, do you get that? Do you get what an important role she played in that? Hmm. And, and, and it's not the same role that you might have read when you read your biographies about them fighting all the time or him being jealous or he's in a state of excitement because she's the muse. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just as he sometimes borrowed some ideas and, and, and words, she got him through a major crisis in Gatsby by drawing those pictures, whatever the hell they were. So that's something I hope somebody learned. Now comes her writing. So he's working <laughs> on, on Tender is the Night. And I love Gatsby, but I really don't love Tender is the Night. I think he sold his friends. I think he really sold his friends. Uh, uh, it's short on that one. And, and, and I'm talking about the Murphys. It took him 10 years. If, funny enough, I'm drinking. <laughs> that's what he was doing when he was supposed to be writing. Perkins was saying, where the hell is the manuscript? Come on, give me something. He struggled. You could tell, by the way, you can smell it in a writer. I was a book editor at Doubleday. You can smell it when a chap gets really, really stuck. You know? And he was stuck, and then he was stuck again, and he was stuck again. She didn't, and she was away. And then she was away at Johns Hopkins. And she starts writing Save Me the Waltz. Do you know about Save Me the Waltz? Good, you know? Who's read it? Raise your paw. Ah, no kidding. All the way through? Cool. You like it? I, love it. I did too. I, I, I think it's pretty. I think Perkins, it, it was Perkins who was the editor. I think he might have edited it a little bit more. There are a couple of really, you know, there, there are some glaring mistakes. Orioles, A-U-R-E-O-L-E-S, got in as Orioles, O-R, the bird. Oopsie daisy. I know, I know. That, that kills me because I'm an editor. You know, it's like, ah, that got through. There were a lot of things that did get through. We're going we're gonna to read some of it in a moment. But it's, 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 a, it's a novel using a lot of the same material <laughs> as tender as the night. The same characters, some of the same people, many of the same scenes. <laughs> she didn't tell him, Mr. Zelda, what's his name, that she was doing it. She told Maxwell Perkins, his editor, and Perkins, who probably smelled a little, you know, profit in this thing, said, fire it in. She's at Johns Hopkins. She's in treatment at, John she's in treatment at Johns Hopkins. Ten years he worked on Tenders of the Night. She knocked this baby out in two months. Now, how is it? You liked it, right? It's fascinating. We're going we're gonna to read some of it. It, it, I, I, we're gonna we're gonna try it. I, it. Can you do a southern draw? Anybody from the south? Anybody from Alabama? It's from the south, not Brooklyn. Okay, that's not the south. <laughs> Use flappers. No, we're not gonna do the. We're not gonna do El Zelda Fitzgerald in Brooklynese. We're gonna. Can you do this? She, she, tell me your name again. Um, Angela. Angela has wor has uh, just completed her work on a, a musical based on the life of Zelda Fitzgerald. Am I right about that? Yeah. yeah, this is really cool. And she just sprung that on me when she came in, scared the hell out of me. So Angela, in a good Southern drawl, is going to read to you from Save Me the Waltz, which is a sort of um, autobiographical novel. There's a character, just like her daddy, who is the judge. His name is Austin. There is a, um, there's a character named Alabama, which is, have you ever read this? You should, you should. Here, you should. It's, it's here, by the way, in the collected writings. It's, it's, and it's long, 
but it, and it should have been edited more. But I want, I want you, and here's, that's the cover of the original one, and that's the cover of the, the posthumous one. She died in 1948. So this is Save Me the Waltz by Zelda Fitzgerald. And I want you, when you read it, just read the first paragraph, which is from the first chapter, and pay attention to one particular word. And Sam, get this. Just read that first graph, yeah. Clematis. yes. Oh. The swing creaks on Austin's porch. A luminous beetle swings ferociously over the clematis. Insects swarm to the golden holocaust of the hall light. Shadows brush the southern night like heavy impregnated mops, soaking its oblivion back to the black heat whence it evolved. Wow. <laughs> wow, don't go anywhere. Wow, beautiful, what's the word? I know, where's it from? Also, last chapter, right? Also, if I may, Hart Crane used it in the bridge. That was beautiful. What's weird about it? Listen, do you mind? You mind just for over here. Don't go anywhere. Melancholy. Oh, you didn't oh, read didn't that part. Finish. Listen to this. Melancholic moon vines trail dark, absorbent pads <laughs> over the siring trellises. <laughs> you did it with a. <laughs> Never mind the absorbent pads part, but melancholic moon vines. Whoa! Keatsian alliteration. It's really overwritten, right? But this is by, no, don't go anywhere, because you're wonderful. It's, it's really overwritten. Bunny Wilson, Edmund Wilson said, she had this really funny way of talking. Uh, her syntax, it was very sort of romantic. I don't know, I'm not from the South, clearly. I'm not, I mean, I can't, I can't quite get this, but she had this very, interesting, fascinating way of talking that others remarked upon, including this literary critic named Bunny Wilson. And it's all the way through this novel. You're so good. You're going to read. This is from, oh, do you remember that part in Gatsby, Sam, not up and down? The river, the city is seen from the Queensboro Bridge is the city seen for the first time. That beautiful lyric voice that, ga that what's his name, Mr. Zelda could do, having learned from Keats, having learned from from John Peel Bishop, by the way. Now listen to Zelda. Go read for a while. You're, you're terrific. Okay. <clears throat> the New York River's dangled lights along the banks like lanterns on a wire. The Long Island marshes stretch the twilight to a blue campagna. Glimmering buildings haze the sky in a luminous patchwork quilt. Bits of philosophy, odds and ends of acumen, the ragged ends of visions, suicided in the sentimental dusk. The marshes lay back, the marshes lay black and flat and red and full of crime about their borders. Yes, Vincent Humans wrote the music through the labyrinth labyrinthine sentimentalities of jazz. They shook their heads from side to side and nodded across town at each other, streamlined bodies riding the prow of the country like metal figures on a fast moving radiator cap. That's so cool. You do so well. It's beautiful. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? No, wait, you're not done. If you don't mind. If you, if you don't mind. You know, it, it's quite, I mean, especially done in a proper voice, it's really, really lyrical and, and gorgeous in many ways. And Perkins said, yeah, we'll go with this thing. And, and Mr. Zelda wasn't really happy to see this come out. Not many reviews, not many of them very nice. And it didn't sell well, which is huge for these two. I'd like to just, I hate to skip, but I'd love for you to read. Endings are so important, right? Like the ending of Gatsby. How does she end this thing? And how does it relate to what he would do with it? If you recall those empty champagne glasses and the gray in that painting, the ending of the novel is this amazing dinner party where she kind of loses the, the, the thread of the conversations, but it all kind of comes to her. And then at the end, she and her husband are sitting there, and the ashtrays are full, and the glasses are empty, and they're looking at the mess after a party. And it begins right there. It's very expressive. <laughs> it's very expressive of, expressive of myself. I just lump everything in a great heap, which I have labeled the past, and having thus emptied this deep reservoir that was once myself, I am ready to continue. They sat in the pleasant gloom of late afternoon, staring at each other through the remains of the party, the silver glasses, the silver tray, the traces of many perfumes. 
They sat together watching the twilight flow through the calm living room that they were leaving like the clear, cold current of a trout stream. You are great. <laughs> we'll find out later on. Ashes and a heap. Sam, ashes and a heap. Christy, ashes and a heap at the end of a twilight. Ashes and a heap and Gatsby. Come on, old chap. Yeah, the valley of ashes. The valley of ashes, the twilight. Holy, sh uh, sorry. I wait, no, it's totally all right. I'm allowed. Holy shit, man. You don't get this? You don't see this? I know this is after, of course. But this, that's, that's ashes in a heap. That's the, that's the end of the party. It's a twilight scene. You read it so beautifully, like the cold current of a trout stream born back ceases, like boats against the current. Come on, chaps, you can do it. Too many beers on this, in this corner. Born back ceaselessly into the past, right? Just flat floating thing. All right, I know, it's get, maybe it's getting a little late. So, right, is it getting late? We should move on fast. Now I'm gonna ruin it. Tender is the night. Here, now I'm gonna ruin it. Now I'm gonna, a little time, do I have a little time? We'll take questions afterwards and we'll talk about your wonderful musical. You see this painting, anybody know it? Ooh, I almost feel like cue the, you know, cue the piano, piano player. This is La Danse by Picasso. I love this painting so much that I made it the cover of my new book. Now comes something fun. Bear with me. This might be the only intellectual moment, so drink up again, or maybe Chrissy, get on your, get on your phone. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is like the, the one serious intellectual moment for a second, right? So look at this thing. Now, Picasso at that time had been hanging around with the ballet russe. Ballet dancers under Diaghilev had very little time. I think you're going to understand this. He was a bastard. I'm allowed, it's Olio, I'm allowed. He was a, seven days a week at the bar. This is where Zelda got a little bit of it too. Seven days a week at the bar, bah, 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 all the time, all the time, including P Picasso's wife, Olga. One day, the story goes, Diaghilev was out of town. They were in Monte Carlo, you see that blue sky? Vernon Duke, who as a great friend of Gershwin, was at the piano. <gasps> you know, I'm just so tempted to just, Actually, probably Stairway to Paradise. He starts playing, and he's probably playing, I don't know, Charleston, he's playing some dance stuff. And the ballet dancers, no bosses around, start cutting a rug. Ever seen this? Remember once, we, uh, 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 remember we once at the New York City Ballet at the gala, right? And all, you, have a, you, have a, you always have this decision at the end of a gala. You're either gonna have another cognac and go to the dance floor, or you're going to go in for the goodie bag, because <laughs> the goodie bags, you know, all disappear. <laughs> so, so, so that night I went for the cognac. What a surprise! And the and the and the dancers came out, and it was Peter Martin's. I remember that, and his wife, Gail C. Kirkland. Remember this? Talk about abusive husbands. His wife slash punching bag, right? Dancing on my grave, was her autobiography, which could be the subtitle for this painting. And they come out, and you just watch these ballet dancers. Go at it, <laughs> you know, just dancing to, to pop music. I mean, it's just, it's amazing to watch. So look at this for a second. You can see the partner. He's a ballet dancer, but he's, he's partnering her. You could see the silhouette of a face there, which some people said, oh, that's Picasso. He often did that. But actually, it was the silhouette of a friend of his who had just committed suicide. Not uh, Kasegema, later. You can see as well these faces. It's a joyous painting of beautiful ballet dancers in Monte Carlo. By God, they were having a ball. Vernon Duke was playing jazz. They were doing the Charleston. But look at the darkness in this painting. I'm going to ruin this whole evening right now and talk about how serious this painting really is, Dancing on My Grave. Look at that, right? And that. Guess who this might be? Holy smokes. Thank you, God. John Richardson, the great biographer of Picasso, suggests that this was, yeah, because she was hanging around with Egorova. She was there. She, it might have been him. He didn't like her, but he would have watched 
as she was dancing around. And what is absolutely marvelous about this painting, by the way, and it's not me that's going to do this part in my book. This is a couple of pages. It's a man named T.J. Clark, a very great Picasso scholar. He said, these were the paintings where Picasso got to the truth. The, the, the Cubist paintings were a little bit of an illusion, a little bit of a trick. But these were the paintings when he got to a sort of truth in painting. And what I love about the painting, if I may, is not how beautiful it is. It's almost the opposite. And here is not me. And this is where you're going to kill me. Like, stay in your seats. Count to 20. I'm going to run out the door. This is a very great scholar, much better than me. Her name is Wendy Steiner. N do you know her work? OK, never mind. This is a, a book called Venus in Exile. And it's about modernism. And those of you who are in this, and uh, Katya back there is a huge contemporary art collector internationally, so she knows what I'm talking about. You don't go in to an artist studio and say, oh, it's beautiful. Like, I remember meeting Basquiat. I would not have gone down into that studio and said, oh, it's so beautiful. He would say, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> beautiful is not what contemporary art, I mean, the Whitney Biennial is not going to say, oh, give me beautiful. They want you know, truth or passion or dystopia. Beautiful is not cool in modernism. So this is Wendy Steiner. Listen, the first paragraph is about Zelda. Don't kill me. I didn't write it. All that Zelda Fitzgerald could do to defend the decorative woman was to appropriate the current defensive art. That in the benighted reality of the 20th century, the artifice of female beauty is a compensation and redemption. Remember that quote at the beginning about the flapper? The pathos, I didn't write this, the pathos and inadequacy of Zelda Fitzgerald's defense of ornamental beauty were proved out in the ruin of her madness, her life consumed in a desperate attempt to achieve perfection as a dancer, writer, painter. That's a woman named Wendy Steiner, a very good writer, and it's called Venus in Exile. Same writer, same book, Picasso. Not necessarily about this painting, which is probably Zelda, but I see the correlation. And now we're going to talk really seriously just for one second about modernism and beauty and Zelda's wonderful bet that beauty would be enough. I remember a New Yorker cartoon years ago. It was one of those Barati dogs. And the guy's reading the newspaper. And this little cute dog is looking up at him. And the guy looks down and says, cute is not enough. <laughs> and it's almost like somebody's looking down at Zelda and saying, beautiful is not enough. Like, you made your bet on beauty. And, you know, I, oh God, I don't want, I'm not looking for self-pity here, but I made, I made a similar bet, you know, that, that the world of beauty was enough. It redeems, right? How with this rage shall beauty hold a plea whose action is no greater than a flower? It's a wonderful line from Shakespeare. And um, this, is how, this is how Steiner talks about Picasso and modernism. And then I'll conclude and we'll take some questions. Picasso, like other modern painters, transformed the allure of the female subject into the formal beauty of line and volume. Wow, that goes with that. And in the process, transferred our response from admiration of her beauty to admiration of his virtuosity. Out goes the woman. In comes the discipline of form, which just happens to mimic the look of the primitive cult object. What a downer way to end this lecture. I apologize. <laughs> this is, I chose this one. This is my book, by the way. The, I'm I left some flyers back there. Please, somebody take one. Um, <laughs> I chose this one. I chose this one not really so much because, oh, you know, Zelda, this is really cool. But I, that I felt, when I, when I did the book, by the way, Maybe one day, Zoom, if you, if you ever have me back, it'll be, when I did the book, the beginning of the book was the Jazz Age freedom. And man, that's Zelda, right? And certainly that's Mr. Zelda and Hart Crane and, uh, oh, I don't know, the, and the Ballet Russe to a certain degree, and all the ones who burned out really fast, uh, Nancy Cunard for sure, and, and Coco Chanel to a certain degree. Freedom starts it. The next part, poor Sam remembers this too well, was order because Corbusier and Leger and others wanted to tighten it all down and bring order after the war. And the third chapter, the third part of my book is truth. And this was supposed to be that. There's freedom in it. You can see it. There's order in it, for sure. It's compositional order. But then there was supposed to be truth in it. 
And the truth in it, and I think the not looking for pity for Zelda, right, but, but trying to think seriously not just about her writing and her ballet and her painting, but about what she means, why we're thinking about her, and why we're toasting her tonight. She made this wonderful bet on beauty. The, you know, the beauty, her own beauty, the beauty of her paintings, the beauty of ballet, the beauty of, of the writing. Like that, the book is so beautifully written, it's almost too beautifully written. And like a lot of us, you know, that, that it, it was like a bad stock pick. And it, and it was a bad stock pick because of history, Sam, not up and down. I mean, it, you don't want to give Picasso too much credit, but in 1925, he had some sense that something really bad was going to happen in Europe again because something more really bad had happened in Europe. So, so it was a bad pick. Beauty was a bad pick historically. It was a very bad pick for her uh, personally. You know? And then, I don't know, we can have a long discussion, Zoom, you and I, over, over cocktails about whether that's a bad pick philosophically. So I've really depressed you at the end of a wonderful evening. <laughs> I would love to take some questions, though, and comments. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Need a drink. Any questions? No questions? Are you kidding me? Yes, question, please. Oh, Scotty is after Francis Scott Key on his mother's side. He was related to Francis Scott Key, who sang the, who, you want to sing the Star Spangled Banner as well? <laughs> who composed the Star Spangled Banner. He was really, really proud of that. In fact, he, that was one of the lines he used to, um, to pick her up. Scotty, yeah, she wanted something else, but th that's not. Scotty Lanahan, I could tell you a lot of stories about Scotty Lanahan. I had to deal with that. I, <laughs> anybody else? No? T tell it, yeah, yeah. Do you think if she were given credit for her, um, for her art, for the art, um, Go ahead. do you want me to start over again? No, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, not, not to bring up the, the ending of her life the way that it was, because I know you don't want to make this about her, but or about that, but um, do you think if she were given the credit at that time for her contribu contributions to literature and, and painting and, 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 and dance, that her life would have ended in a different way? Oh, wow, that's a wonderful question. What if she gotten some of the credit? What if they shared the credit and her friend was married to H.L. Mencken and she got credit, Sarah, they were from, she was from Montgomery. Yeah, I think that would have made a big difference in her life personally. It certainly would have been an interesting rewrite of the jazz age. And why, that, why not? Gertrude Stein's as big as they come, and I don't mean that literally. I mean, you know, in terms of reputation, she was also built like an Oakland Raider linebacker. But <laughs> no, but she was a big, she was a big name in that. Um, there's a, here, this is, she didn't like this lady, but this is Anita Luce, gentlemen prefer blondes. She was big. Dorothy Parker was big. Why, there's, there, there, was, there was nothing that would have kept me. And, and Edna Ferber, who I don't think is near, n nearly as interesting, there's no, there was nothing really keeping her from being big, except he, as you probably saw in that, in that uh, show, that Amazon show, he kept saying, look, I'm the writer. I'm, I've got to be the one. I've got to be the one because I earn the money because I'm the one who's, who they know. But she was a star in her own way. And I hope. I mean, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I hope when you listen to that wonderful reading, she could write. I think she could paint well enough. Maybe, maybe not by your standards, but I, no, I mean, I, th I think she painted pretty well. I think she could write. She deserved it. That's why we're here. I wouldn't do this for Zoom if she didn't have the, have the you know, she couldn't dance. <laughs> I don't think she could dance properly, but she could do the, these other things. It's a lovely question, too. It's the what if. Would she have, would it have been, would it have redeemed it's a lovely question. Any more questions or comments? Uh oh, Gabby. Oh, sorry. Um, why do you think that even in Venus in Exile, she still holds, just from that comet bait alone, when you take um, Zelda's comment about beauty being an object, woman being an object, and then Picasso, she praises him for the same thing, but then lamb lambasts Zelda for the exact same thing. That's good. This was her mantra. This is what she wrote. This is under her byline, by the way. This is not. This was not Mr. Zelda. What's his name? This is her mantra. Being young, being lovely, being an object, 
that's the flapper. That's what, and so therefore, and, and in a way, and what, what Steiner is doing, and Steiner is a very uh, solid scholar, is saying there's a kind of commodity side to that. She was selling it. I don't, I don't want to go too far with that, right? Because I don't want to get killed. But she was, she, that's what this is all about in many ways. And that's what Steiner is talking about. And then the next part of this is it, when, it, when it fell apart with modernism, where beauty is destroyed and virtuosity comes in, Am I taking you away from your question? Yep. She would, that's her quote. That's why, that's why it's curious. And that's why it's tense in here right now. <laughs> that's why I want to run to the elevator <laughs> before I get torn apart. Thank you, though. It's a good, it's a good point. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. <laughs>